Five here in Singapore. And with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Dr. Hammond Pierce all the way from Australia to share with us the latest on AI coding in the exciting area of coding and programming. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, cool. Okay. So um, when it comes to AI coding, the session earlier you were in is uh, very popular. There were a lot of questions. And I guess it's because uh, so much... Um, Anecdotes that we hear about how a Gen, the latest iteration of AI, Gen AI, is you know uh, enabling access to novice and uh, people who have no programming experience to actually do some programming. And um, how have you found the experience so far for you know talking to your peers or even to friends? I is it a hype? Uh, I think it has the elements of being a hype, but I think it's more than just that, right? At generative AI, it is exciting. It, it, it definitively does make it easier for people to program. It democratizes, in a sense, the technical world that has, you know, in some ways been locked behind uh, complicated education or, or, or difficult to access resources in terms of trying to learn how new programming languages work or new paradigms work. So it is exciting. You know, I, I love that generative AI opens the world to more programmers and makes it easier for programmers to get started. Um, so yes, yeah, so you know there is a hype. I, I think uh, I think there's a, a thing at the moment called vibe coding, which is where you just give an absolute minimal instructions to a, to an AI and have it build software for you. But that's fun. That's exciting. You know. I, I, Software doesn't need to be, you know, just drudgery. It is allowed to have fun too. Right, and uh, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, enabling a large uh, segment of the population to have this uh, kind of exciting experience, it's also enabling the cyber criminals as well, isn't it? Well, yes, um, it, it does enable anyone to access programming. I don't know if that's uh, a huge problem when it comes to things like cyber criminals, because at the end of the day, cyber criminals have always had resources to help them find or obtain high quality programming or hacking skills. So from that point of view, you know, okay, maybe it, 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 it helps under-resourced people um, that, that might want to try something out. But for the most part, I don't think that's a particularly real or, or worrisome risk for generative AI. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. So there's a few sort of uh, risks that uh, the panel earlier you were on touched on, and I would like to delve a little bit further into those themes, uh, one of which is hallucination or the mm -hmm. code quality, right? Mm -hmm. So for our general audience who's not quite familiar with what these are, like hallucination mm -hmm. or the quality of the code, why could it be uh, worse or better mm -hmm. in the HGN AI scenario? Can you yes, explain? Yes, definitely. So just as I said, it's very exciting that we're letting people, more people program who don't have as much skill with programming or don't have as much experience with programming. And similarly, we're letting people who have a lot of experience programming program faster with things like generative AI. That's exciting, and, and I don't want what I'm about to say to detract from that because it is exciting, but it's risky. It is risky because the code that the AI produces is not always of particularly high quality. It can be good for fun experiments, and that's where the joy of programming can come in. I think one, uh, I've forgotten their name, but, but one person called it um, programming for one, right? If you're using it for just yourself, fantastic. You know, I'm just making little scripts that bring me happiness. If you're using it in a production website, which is managing you know, sensitive data, like medical insurance or banking details or something like that, there are a lot of risks you need to take into account when using generative AI for programming. Um, it's not to say that people don't already use these tools in these contexts. They absolutely do. I think one study, or even Google themselves, actually said that up to 25% of the code that's being added to their code base is now being made with generative AI, right? So real companies with real amounts of data are using these programming uh, tools to help them program faster. They're using AI to write code for them. But it comes with a risk, and that risk is in, in some cases model hallucinations, which is where a model produces something that is sort of out of the ordinary that we don't want it to produce, but even when it just produces bad quality code to begin with. And I don't necessarily mean bad from a functionality standpoint in that it's bad because it doesn't do what we want it to do. The real worrying concern is when it does do what we want it to do, but it does it in a really unsafe way. And that unsafe that, that, that problem is when we're thinking about it from a security standpoint. So it could 
functionally complete the task that you want it to do, but it could do it in what's called a vulnerable way or a weak way. And, and, and the actual implementation that the AI has made leaves it vulnerable to some malicious person coming along to the cyber criminals that you mentioned earlier that look at your website or look at your software and go, hey, this wasn't built properly. And because it's not built properly, I can attack it. And when I attack it, I can extract secret data. I could extract financial data. I could extract things that I can use to blackmail or sell. So there's a real risk that uh, as we make code more democratic and more people can do it, you also need to pair that with processes that can catch exploitable mistakes. Because if you're not experienced, or even if you are experienced but not looking at it too closely, you can leave yourself open to mistakes which can have really bad consequences. So I, would, I, want, I want to delve deeper into you know, this aspect of insecurity when it comes to Gen AI uh, encoding, right? And basically, it's, at the end of the day, it's about inheriting the insecurities in the training data that's used to train the Gen AI model. And a lot of these training data are, say, for example, in GitHub or some open source uh, databases, which already contains lots of insecurities. So you are just basically, like as you were saying in the panel, replicating some of these problems. Yes, yes, it's, it's two things. One is that, yes, the language models, ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, Gemini, etc., they're all being trained on what's available on the internet, which includes things like code on GitHub and other open source um, platforms. That code can have problems. Just because code is on GitHub, it doesn't mean it's good code, right? There's lots of examples of code online uh, being very poor quality, and so as a result, you know, you might have some code which has serious security problems that's that's up on GitHub. It might even say in the repository, "Hey, don't use this code." We you know we we're putting this up for documentation purposes, but the language model might not understand that during the training process, and so what happens is, yes, the language model can reproduce. These, these bad code patterns, these weak code patterns that it has seen before. It goes, well, oh, you know, you wanted, me to, you wanted me to make a login form or something, and you wanted me to make it in this way. Well, I saw this code once that made it in this way, so I'm just going to reproduce that, even though that code is, is problematic, deeply problematic. But another problem actually comes from when maybe the code was good a long time ago, but, 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 but so-called software best practice, this, this, this notion of what, what people should be doing, that notion changes over time. So I'm going to get very technical for just one split second and, and talk about one specific example. So if you have an audience that's interested, they can look it up. But um, when we're storing passwords, uh, which are, you know, we use those to log in, we want to make sure that we, just, we store them in a secure way so that if they ever get stolen from us, they can't be used to actually obtain the passwords. So that's done with a process called hashing. That's basically where the technical stuff stops. But there's lots of different ways to hash. And a long time ago, one of the popular hashing algorithms was called MD5. Now, that's fine. Nowadays, we don't use MD5 because it's, it, it, it's, it's not that it's bad, it's just that it's kind of broken. It's not strong enough in the face of modern computers that are so powerful that they can break passwords. Now the problem is, it used to be. And so there's lots of code online which uses MD5. It uses this particular way of, of, of doing this hash. Um, now what happens when a language model, when you say, hey, chat GPT, I want to store a password, what should I do? Okay, it's not to say that ChatGPT will do it because ChatGPT might be a bit smarter than that, but some language models will say, well, you know, I saw all of this code online that uses MD5 for hashing, so I'm going to encourage you to use MD5. But that's not what you should do because that we know that that's now a, a sort of a broken thing. So that was a sort of a little technical example, but there's so many more of them where the 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 what we consider to be good software, that is continuously changing as the world around us changes and as the threat landscapes change. And so code, which is an artifact, not just of the people who made it, but a, 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 of a moment in time in which they created it, that might not map very well onto, onto the current moment in time. So you end up with this problem where it might be producing code that it was at once was good, but mm -hmm. isn't anymore. And then I'm gonna add one more thing. <laughs> right which is that also sometimes it just makes mistakes that have nothing to do with the training data. Sometimes you ask it to do something it's never seen before, so it doesn't know what to do. That's the most common moment when you get a hallucination that just makes something up which looks plausible but is very wrong. 
Right, okay. I, I, I can think of examples in the chat GPT world where you ask uh, the, the, the chat about a question about history, uh, inventing a new country, mm -hmm, and you could mm -hmm, possibly mm -hmm. come up with some hist yeah. uh, well, fictional uh, story, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, at the panel, you also talked about how you can feed uh, the uh, AI, Gen AI co coding process through the normal traditional software development security cycle kind of uh, mitigation con and controls to control some of these uh, problems. How well can it sort of uh, safeguard some of these uh, challenges? So generative AI itself has got a lot of issues when it comes to trying to prove any particular safety property. So most of the time when we're using generative AI and we want to use it in a safe way, we, we add so-called guardrails, which is sort of this nebulous term, it can mean a lot of different things. But in the security landscape, our guardrails might be something along the lines of a security scanner, something that's continuously monitoring what's coming out of the language model and comparing it to some security rules about what is known to be good and what is known to be bad. So that's one way that we can try and make the AI outputs a bit more secure. But it's definitely not like a golden bullet. Mm. Like it, it, there, there's, there's problems with that too. Some security rules can't be tested on the fly. They kind of need your whole application to be existing before they can be checked. Some security properties are not even a function of the code that's being written. They're sort of a function of the application and, and the domain in which it lives um, and the regulations that your business actually falls under. So sometimes it's going to be a real challenge to know whether or not a language model actually is or isn't outputting code that's bad because it's a, it's a function of more than just the code. It's a function of sort of, of your whole business sometimes. Um, but yes, you can combine generative AI with security scanners, and I would advise anyone who was using generative AI for code to think about how to do that. Um, you know, there's a number of open source ones that you can use if you're not doing it for commercial purposes. If you are doing it for commercial purposes, then you can get a license. Um, and, and, you know, those are the sorts of tools that I would be saying you know, really investigate them if you're, if you're a business that's using uh, AI for code. Well, a lot of people say that uh, generative AI is great for developing the first layer of code, but eventually you still need the human developers to come in and actually finalize the code, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Um, this is like a human in the loop sort of development. Um, that also does depend on the quality of the human that's, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to, in terms it's of true. their skill set. You know, if, if you're true. getting someone who doesn't know how to program to tick a box or something, that's not going to help you that much. Um, but yes, you know, even um, even GitHub Copilot, right? This is the, the, the so maybe, maybe the flagship coding assistance model. GitHub Copilot has a little disclaimer on their website that says, hey, any code that we produce using GitHub Copilot you need to check that with a security scanner. You need to write security tests because the responsibility for it is ultimately on you as the developer sitting in the driving seat. So, so yes, human in the loop development is, is pretty necessary um, and that human should know a few things about security to, to really understand the code. So what are your thoughts about you know, um, using a Gen AI to uh, do coding and uh, reducing or improving rather the uh, productivity of the developers, but then you still at the end of the day need the human in the loop process. So how does that productivity sort of uh, equation play out? I, I mean, I think that there, I, I think it's pretty much a foregone conclusion at this point that language models do increase productivity. Certainly, multiple businesses have come out like Google being like, hey, you know, we did a study, all of our developers using uh, a language model. They were faster at writing code. They spent less time solving problems. They write more lines of code per day. So I think the productivity question's pretty much been solved. Even in our own research, we did a user study where we paired users, some with language models, some without. The ones with language models, they wrote more code and that code passed more tests. So productivity is, is definitely... It is a thing. They, 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 people write code faster with language models. Now, do they write code more securely with language models is a separate question. Right. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily look like they, they make better code from a security standpoint. It doesn't necessarily look like they make worse code using language models, but they do make more of it. So, um, yeah, there's uh, some thoughts there. Right. I, I got a lot more questions, but I'm just conscious of the time. So two more, mm -hmm. right? So um, more coding, right? But I guess uh, there's a lot less, uh, well, transparency into how AI, Gen AI, come out with the code. So if you do go through this debugging, you know, uh, exercise, how how does Gen AI and the explainability help or not help? So 
only a few models claim to have something that they call explainability, where they can try and justify whatever they've made. That explainability is a pretty thin veneer because it doesn't explain how it got its explanation, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's a circular process. You go justify your answer and then how do you justify the justification, right? It's just a function of the training data at the end of the day. Um, we, we do not know for most language models that are being used like Copilot exactly what training data they have been trained over. Um, there's some questions around intellectual property, um, you know, what was the license that the code was. Other language models have been more transparent about this. I believe that there is one called StarCoder, which was actually just trained on what's called MIT licensed code, which is a lot more permissive about what you can do with it. Um, so, you know, some, some language models are thinking about the sort of IP protection, but, you know, it's still an enormous quantity of code. Who were the people that wrote that code? Were they good developers? Were they bad developers? You know, you don't know any of that. So, so yes, the, 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 there's this big mystery box every time you reach for a language model, which is what do you actually know? How did you learn it? And, and, and what are you going to do with that knowledge? Um, and, and, yeah, these, these so-called explanations are, they're not... They're not useless, but you know, there, there's there's a, a big question around, well, what, what's the explanation for your explanation, you know, and 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 so on and so forth. But you need what's called a white box model where you can really peer inside and understand how something's come to a decision. Where you know these these sort of post hoc explanations are are not uh, really doing that. Right. So the productivity improvements out uh, trumps the uh, the mystery uh, challenge. I think the productivity mm -hmm. trumps a lot because at the end of the day, everyone wants their developers to write code faster. Right. Right. Okay. So my last question. So we're talking about writing code. What about reversing code? Reverse engineer code. Have you seen sort of interesting cases? Yes. Yes. Definitely. So so reverse engineering code is actually fascinating because language models, in addition to being able to write code, you can just give them a pile of code and say, tell me how this code works. That's amazing. Um, the, 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 sometimes they're better at it than other times. Uh, sometimes they're very enthusiastically wrong. Um, but one of the, the amazing capabilities of language models, and it is amazing, is they are so good at pattern recognition, right? So by pattern recognition, I mean you give them a piece of code that they, they might not have seen exactly that code before, but they've seen other code that looks like this code. And so they go, well, you know, I, I haven't seen this before, but, you know, it looks pretty similar to this, say, this code which, which calls a web function online or it, 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 it calls something and sends a file or, you know, um, and, and that's, that's amazing, an amazing capability when it comes to reverse engineering if you've got code to explain. Now, if you don't have the code to explain, you've just got a binary. People are working on this because, again, they really want the ability to just say, given a, given a piece of binary, uh, tell me everything. Um, particularly when it comes to something like malware, right? You know, we get a virus on our computer. We want to know what that virus does if we're a security researcher. It would be great to be able to give the virus to a language model and say, pull this to bits and tell me all the secrets of it. Um, I think that there's still some research to go there. There's some work to go for the people who make and train language models to get that really reliable, but I definitely see some promise there. Oh, wow, fascinating. I'm sure that we can uh, talk a lot about this, uh, maybe perhaps next year, when uh, there's a lot of uh, more progress in that area. But I'm quite conscious that we're running into the drinks uh, networking session. So uh, thank you so much for giving us a quick glimpse into you know this exciting area of AI encoding and the benefits and challenges. So thank you, Dr. Adam Pierce. Thank you so much.